Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. And you know, I don't know what it was like uh, for you as a parent, uh, but when the day finally came uh, for Clarice and I to bring our first child home from the hospital, uh, I um, found that uh, I was struggling with what you might call a kaleidoscope of uh, varying emotions. Uh, they were all over the map, and so a big part of me was elated, it was excited, it was overcome with joy as I proudly uh, held that six-pound, four-ounce bundle of humanity in my arms. And so as a father, I was over the moon. But you know, along with that, there was another part of me, a part that had a completely different set of feelings attached to them. And, of course, they were uh, more like feelings of anxiety, uh, more like feelings of apprehension, feelings of fear. I would even go as far as to say feelings of all-out dread. Because as I was looking down at that helpless, innocent little face, it was like he was staring right back at me. And uh, as he was, he was saying things like, I'm depending on you, and I'm counting on you. I'm trusting that you are going to be the parent, the father, that I so desperately need you to be to me. And so, of course, for me, that struck a deep sense of fear and terror in um, what was my unproven, inexperienced parenting heart, Uh, the thought that uh, I now had to be a provider. I had to be an instructor. I mean, you fill in the blank. I had to be a caregiver, a coach, a mentor, a model to another human being. You know, that is enough to bring any father and mother straight to their knees in desperation. In fact, I like how author Max Licato in his book Fearless puts it. He says, I don't care how tough or brave you think you are, Dad. Whether you're a Navy SEAL who specializes in high-altitude skydiving behind enemy lines, or if you spend every day making million-dollar split decisions on the stock market, every dad melts in fear the moment he feels the full force of fatherhood. And how many know it's true that the semi-truck called parenting comes loaded down with all kinds of very real and weighty fears. What kind of fears? Fears that we might fail our children. Fears that we won't be able to give them what they need. Fears that we won't have enough wisdom or patience or money or love to be the parents that they so desperately need us to be. We struggle with fear. And every parent who's here today knows all about that. Uh, Because you've been there many times yourself And so that's why this morning we're going to be getting a a, a brand new series of messages we are calling Parenting Not for Cowards. Parenting Not for Cowards. And so let me say that whether you're a parent or not, we really want this series to be connecting and relevant to everyone. And um, maybe you're here and uh, you're a high school student or a university student. Maybe you're here, you're single, you don't have kids. Maybe you are, are married. And for various reasons, you don't have children. You know, I want to encourage you, whatever you do, don't check out through this series. Don't stay away through this series. I believe that God has some wonderful things to say to all of us through this series. Uh, In fact, all of us, whether we have children or not, could learn a thing or two, right? Because we have nieces and nephews and we have neighbors and You know, we live in a world filled with children. Matter of fact, we have an awesome children ministry right here at the church. And you could take some of the things that we're going to be talking about here in this parent series and and sign up and help out in our Mission Possible Kids ministry. Of course, another thing this series will do is it will give you a greater understanding. And with understanding comes compassion uh, for parents around you. How many know parents can use as much compassion as they can get? Any parents here agree with that? Amen. 
And so, uh, so I want to encourage all of us to lean in and be part of this series as we go through it. Now, let me mention that next Sunday, uh, we have a guest speaker because we have a men's conference, and he's going to be speaking at our men's conference, at our men's retreat. Uh, but we also have him sharing on Sunday. He's not going to be talking about parenting. Pastor uh, Terry Murphy from, from uh, Moose Jaw Victory Church, he's going to be with us next Sunday. So we will be taking a break from the series but, um, but we're going to dive into this. Uh, turn to the person next to you and say, you're going to learn something new. Just tell them that. Learn something new. Something new. And so we're here to learn. So why, if we're here to learn, why don't you take your Bibles and turn them on or turn them to Mark 5, verse 21. We'll dive into it this morning. And I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translations for those of you who have a Bible app and um, have access to a variety of versions, New Living Translation. But Mark 5, verse 21, it says, Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived... When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Now I want to stop here for just a second because I want to say a few things about this man called Jairus. One thing we do know about him is it says that he was a leader, the leader of a local synagogue. In other words, he was a very well-respected and influential man in the community. In fact, in Jewish culture at this time, not only might he have been the leader of the synagogue, but he could have very possibly been a city councilman or even the mayor, the mayor of that city, which meant that it was his job uh, to uh, welcome, warmly welcome, any dignitaries or celebrities that would happen to be visiting his town. That was part of his job. And the way he would do it was with much pomp and celebration. That was part of his job. And yet we see here that that's not at all what is happening. That rather than there being fanfare and celebration and pomp, when Jairus sees Jesus, a celebrity, a dignitary, approaching his town, the Bible says he immediately falls at his feet. He falls in fear and desperation. And, of course, the reason why he does that is because he is wrestling uh, with, uh, with a big problem. He is a terrified parent, terrified of what? You see it here in the next verse. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so that she can live. And so Jairus finds himself in a place where all of us, as parents, find ourselves at one point or another. It's called a place of deep worry and fear. It's a place that's filled with all kinds of anxiety and desperation. And for Jairus, it was because his daughter was sick. She was nigh unto death. That's why he was in that place. But for many of us here this morning, it never has to be that serious or terminal. It never does. In fact, it could be as simple as a child who's failing and falling behind in school. That can fill us with fear. Uh, it can be that they are rebelling and acting out at home. It could be that they're making wrong choices, hanging out with the wrong crowd, or experimenting with the wrong stuff. It really doesn't take all that much for us as parents to become anxious and fearful like Jairus was here. Fear is a very big part of parenting. Matter of fact, it was just last Monday, Easter Monday, I received a call from a frantic father whose 16-year-old had just been hauled into the police station to be questioned and possibly charged with a robbery that occurred here in the city. And as the father was speaking to me over the phone, you could feel the thick, dark presence of anxiety and fear in his voice as he wondered what was going to happen to his teenage son. That's exactly what parenting is like. And that the demons who run the distilleries of fear concoct a very potent and powerful brew for those of us who choose to be parents. Whether it's a mom and a dad who are keeping vigil uh, at a neonatal unit all night long because of their little one who's in there, 
or the parents who see their child progressively retreating into the dark world of video games and social media, or just the simple sound of a child's cry as they skin their knee in the front of the driveway. Parenting has a way of filling us uh, with all kinds of fresh doses of, of anxiety and fear. And yet the question we want to look at this morning is just what do we do about it? What do we do when we as parents are flooded with wave after wave of anxiety and fear? What do we do? What do you do? Well, you know, surprisingly, the answers to that question, some of them anyway, are found right here in this story. And I want us to look at it uh, this morning. The first thing I see here is what I call the, the journey we travel. And how many of you know as parents, we're called to take our children on quite a number of road trips? And I don't just mean in the summertime. I'm talking about trips that, to take them to school and trips to bring them back. Trips that take them to the doctor and then to the dentist. We take our children swimming and then to hockey and then to dance and to basketball and to, to, then to gymnastics. And just when we th think that we don't have one more drop of gas in our parenting tank, we get up and take them to birthday parties and sleepovers and graduation ceremonies. How many parents can say amen or oh me? That's right. It's the many varied roads we travel as, the, as we do this thing called parenting. And yet I just want to say as, as necessary and important as all those are, we never want to lose sight of the most important trip that we as parents ought to embark on, and that is the one we see Jairus taking right here. It says that when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her and heal her so she can live. In other words, as fearful and desperate of a father as he was, terrified, he knew enough to deliberately, intentionally seek out the person of Christ on his behalf of his daughter and, and, and fall at, the, at Christ's feet and entreat him to come and minister to my dying daughter. And I just want to say that as parents who deeply love and care for our children, how many of you know we need to do the same? We need to travel the same prayerful road as Jairus did. We need to get in the habit of bringing our children and the many fears and anxieties that we have about our children straight to the feet of Jesus in prayer. Because at the end of the day, he's the only one who has the power and grace to both hear, hear, and respond. Amen? And you know, there's two other places in the Gospels where, like Jairus, we find desperate, fearful parents coming to Jesus seeking help for their children. Uh, one is a mother who made the journey straight out of the hills of, of the Canaanite Valley to find Jesus. And when she finds him, she pleads with him, Lord, have mercy on my daughter who is vexed and tormented. She was a parent. The other is a father whose child was possessed with an epileptic spirit, one that would throw him on the ground and then roll him in the fire. And at first he asks the disciples to, to help him, but they can't do it. And so he desperately comes to the feet of Jesus and he says, have mercy and heal my son. Three separate cases. And yet, although they're three different parents, they have one dark and troubling thing in common. They all had hurting and struggling children. Just like maybe you're here this morning and you have the same thing, hurting, struggling children. That's what they had in common. And yet, we see here that in every case, without exception, Jesus responds to their tears. He responds to their pleas, and he answers their prayers. In fact, never once on any occasion does Jesus ever say, sorry, I don't have time for it. Never once do you see him saying, sorry, I'm too busy, or sorry, but it don't bother me with such small, trivial things. You never once see him doing any of that. 
But rather, in every single case, he responds deliberately, decisively, lovingly, compassionately, because that's exactly what Jesus does in the face of hurting, suffering children. He hears our pleas, he hears our prayers. He comes to comfort and heal them. And that should bring to us as parents, it should be a great source of solace to all of us. Because what it tells us is that God will not look away when we ask Him for help for our children. He won't turn a blind eye and He won't turn a deaf ear to the many needs that we as parents have to offer up to Him. But he invites us, he invites us to come in prayer on behalf of our children, promising us that if we will pray, he will hear, and when he will hear, he will respond. Amen? Look at the promise he, or the invitation he gives us in Lamentations. Rise during the night and cry out. Pour out your hearts like water to the Lord. Lift up your hands to Him in prayer, pleading for your children, for in every street they faint with hunger. And what this verse tells us is that our first and foremost responsibility as parents is to pray and intercede for our children. We do that first. Before we dress them, and before we feed them, and before we change them, and before we teach them, and guide them, and discipline, and instruct them, and fund them, that we as parents are, are called by God to intercede for our children, to bring them to the feet of Jesus, and pray for His mercy and grace upon their lives. Amen? And you know, as a parent... And now a proud grandparent of three beautiful grandchildren. I know there's a whole lot of things I can't do, right? I'm not the perfect parent. I know there's a lot of things I'm I'm not all that good at. But, you know, one thing I do know I can do, and one thing I know that you can do, one thing I know we can all do, and that is to pray and intercede for our children, to pray for them. You know, I love what Ruth Graham had to say about this, Billy Graham's wife. She says, as a mother, my job is to take care of the possible and trust God with the impossible. And I do all that through prayer. That's my job. I do the possible. God does the impossible. But you know, whether it's possible or impossible, I cover it all. I I bathe it all with the covering of prayer. That, That is the journey that we as parents are called to travel on. Straight to the feet of Jesus as we pour our anxieties and fears, our questions and doubts, our burdens and needs of our children to Him. And I feel, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I feel that some of us as parents have been carrying a a heavy burden on us this last season. And it's caused a lot of sleepless nights and anxiety and stress. And I feel that the heart of God, Jesus, is saying to you, come and lay your burdens at my feet. I love your children more than you love them. And if you will but place them in my hands, you'll see what I will do in their lives. Amen. And so the first thing I see here is the road we travel. The second thing I see here is the voices we listen to. And many of you know how this story goes. Jesus is approached by Jairus, a frantic and frenzy father, asking him, come to my house, pray for my daughter, she's nigh unto death. And as Jesus begins to do just that, make his way to Jairus' house, all of a sudden a woman with an issue of blood reaches out and touches the hem of his garment. And the Bible says she's immediately healed. And looking around, Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciple says, Lord, what do you mean who touched you? The whole crowd is pressing against you. What do you mean who touched you? And yet Jesus said that, no, it's a different kind of touch. It was a touch of faith and anticipation. 
And the Bible says that the woman, realizing what had happened, came, fell at Jesus' feet, and looking at her, Jesus said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. It's a glorious story within a story. Right? A story within a story. But the only problem is, is that this story took a whole lot of time. It took time, and of course time was one thing that Jairus didn't have much of because his daughter was sick and dying. And so just as they are about to get back on task, back on mission, escorting Jesus to Jairus' house, a messenger arrives and look at what he has to say. It says, well, he, Jesus, was still speaking to her. That's the woman. Messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. Absolutely devastating, crushing news. How do you think Jairus felt about that news? It's like the voices were saying, Jairus, you took too long. Jairus, you you weren't fast enough. Jairus, you lingered too much, and now your daughter is dead. There's no use even troubling the master. It's the kind of news that came to Jairus as he journeyed to Jesus' house. And really, there's only one name for it. It's called the voice of fear. And how many know that as parents, that is a voice we are all very familiar with because sometimes we hear it echoing in our own hearts over and over again. Voices that tell us that as parents, we aren't good enough. As parents, we don't have what it takes. As parents, we are woefully deficient for the task at hand. Amen. Voices that say to us, the grades are too low. The peer pressure is too strong. The rebellion is too deep. The relationship is too fractured. The illness is too advanced. And the behavior is far too toxic. And what it does is it produces in us waves of anxiety and fear. Until we are paralyzed as parents. We don't know what to do. And you know, I just want to say that as parents, as hard as it is sometimes, we never want to give ourselves over to that voice, that voice of fear. Because we can't be the parents. You simply can't be the mom and dad that God has called you to be if you are doing it out of a spirit of fear. And the reason why is Depending on our personality, fear will cause us to do one of two things. The first thing fear will do is it will make us too controlling. How many parents know what that's all about? We're, We're full of fear, we become too controlling. Our parenting style is like that of a paranoid prison guard. Monitoring every second of our child's life, hovering, checking, scrutinizing, interrogating every person and thing until our children become so stifled and smothered they can't grow. We call them helicopter parents. And fear will drive us to that place, the place of paranoia and control. Maybe some of you can relate to that. Don't look at the person next to you. Husband and wife, straight ahead right now. But that's what, depending on our personalities, that's what fear can do. But you know, the funny thing is, is fear can cause us to go to the total other side of the spectrum and cause us to be too permissive. Why is that? Because out of fear, we have insecurities. And because of our insecurities, we don't want our children to get angry at us. Oh my, what would happen if that was to take place? What would happen if little Johnny didn't love me, if he didn't appreciate me? We become fearful because we don't want to disappoint or upset our children, and so we overindulge them. We give them whatever they want. We let them do whatever they please because we're afraid that they might reject us. It's called being high on hugs and low on discipline. And how many of you know it's just as bad as the first, right? And so some of you as parents, you might be struggling with that one. Husband's wife look just straight ahead right now. 
That's what fear will do. Fear, fear will either turn us into controlling prison guards who hover and scrutinize our children to death, or it turns us into permissive pushovers that give, that, 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 that give them whatever they want. And that's why it's so important as parents, we learn how to deal with our anxieties and fears. We need to learn how to deal with it because the fact is this, if we don't take our fears to Christ, then eventually we will take them out on our kids. Amen? If you don't give them to Jesus, then eventually you're going to impart those fears in some way to your kids. And so the question we want to ask ourselves this morning is just what do we do? What do you do with those screaming voices of doubt and fear that fill your heart and bombard your mind? What do you do with them? Well, we see here in the story what we're to do. The people tell Jairus, your daughter is dead, and so there's no use troubling the teacher now. And yet, look at the response Jesus gives to him. But Jesus overheard them. How many think it's awesome that Jesus overhears your fears and your doubts, and he doesn't condemn you? He hears the the fear in your voice, the fear in your parenting. Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. And so we hear, here we have two voices that every one of us as parents will hear. The first one is the voice of fear and unbelief that says it's too late, it's too far gone, you might as well give up, nothing good is ever going to happen. And the other one is the voice of faith that says God is good. He is faithful. And and he loves your children more than you love them. And, and, And as you stand in prayer, and as you stand in his promises, as you stand on his word as parents, you can be sure that God will hear. He will move on your behalf. That is the voice of faith that all of us as parents need to tune into. Amen. And I know Clarice and I have had to do it on many, many occasions in our journey as parents. And of course, we still are doing it today. In fact, we do, now that we're grandparents, we do it even more. Man, I thought when the kids grew up and left the house, life would get easier. Well, in some ways it does. But then, of course, the kids have kids. And then it gets complicated again. Right, And then those fears even can get bigger again. Because now you're not just praying for your kids, you're praying for your grandkids. And you start doing it all over again. And, and, and so somehow we have to mute the voices of doubt and fear and, and tune into the voices of promise and faith. And so the question I want to ask you this morning is just what voices have you been in the habit of listening to lately? Are they the ones that say it's too late, it's too far gone? The situation is too toxic, the hurt is too deep, the problems are too large. Why even trouble the master? In other words, I gave up praying for my kids a long time ago. And I want to encourage you that if you have grown weary and well-doing when it comes to taking your children to the feet of Jesus, I want to encourage you to lift up your heart again, lift up that heart cry again, and begin to, 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 to cry out afresh to Him because He doesn't grow weary even though we do. He hears our fears and all the things that hold us and capture us as parents. I want to encourage you to make a fresh stand, to listen to the voice of faith that says, don't be afraid, trust in God, believe in my promises, and what I have spoken over you, your marriage, your family, your children, we want to tune into that divine, redemptive voice that will pull our family out of darkness and straight into the glorious light of God. Amen? And so we see here the journey we travel, one that leads us straight to the feet of Jesus. 
And then we see the voices we listen to, voices of faith, not of fear, voices that bring hope, not of despair. And then lastly this morning, I see here what I call the doorway we open, the doorway. Let's say that word together, doorway. It's a doorway. And of course, you see it here. It says, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she only sleeps. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and the three of his disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha, kum, which means little girl, Get up. And the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. How many know some pretty good things happen whenever we take time to invite Jesus in through our doorway? Amen. Good things happen when we invite Jesus into our home and our family. Good things. And you know, when I read this, I see three distinct separate things that took place because Jairus was intentional enough to invite Jesus into his home. You know, the first one is that the house was unified. It says that Jesus took Jairus and his wife into the room where the girl was laying and had them stand together as parents, okay? I don't know where they were standing before that. Maybe the wife was shivering in the corner of the kitchen, crying uncontrollably with sorrow and sadness. Maybe Jairus was standing offside by the door. They were separate, but Jesus brings them together and they stand together in the presence of their daughter. How many of you know so often in families we see the presence of anxiety and disappointment and pain and crisis and calamity. We see it so often dividing and separating a home. Storm clouds start mounting. Life begins to turn difficult and dark. And rather than husband and wife joining hands and moving closer together, oftentimes what happens is they let go. They begin to drift further and further apart, allowing their fear and pain to divide and separate them. And that's why it's so important that as husband and wives, we learn how to bring Jesus into our marriage, bring him into the doorway of our marriage, our family, into our home, and straight into the middle of all our dysfunction and mess. Some of you are saying, well, I wouldn't bring Jesus into my house, not until I get it all straightened up. I wouldn't bring Jesus into my heart. i got to clean myself up first. got to quit smoking. i got to quit drinking. Now i got to quit toking. Because it's legal, right? i got to quit doing all this crap, all this stuff, and then I can become a Christian. Then I can invite Jesus in my heart. I'll tell you, you don't wait until you get your life together before you invite Jesus in. You invite him in the crap now. Invite him in your fear, your dysfunction now. Don't wait until things are half together. You'll never get them together. You invite him through the doorway now. Amen? And when he comes, he'll unify. Unify. And so I would encourage you as husband and wife, have a time of of family devotions, family prayer. Right? Have a time when you invite the presence of Christ into your home because when Jesus is there, he brings us together. He stabilizes the marriage and strengthens it. That's the first thing I see here. The house was unified. You know, the second thing is I see that the house was cleansed. You see it here, that Jesus turns to all those who were weeping and mourning. Think about it. Everyone who was filling every room with doubt and unbelief and toxicity, what does he do? He kicks them out. He says, you guys, just get out of here. He probably said it nicer than that, being Jesus. But he kicks them out. And you know, he'll do the very same thing for us. If we take the time to pray and intentionally invite him into our family and home. He'll kick the doubt out and the fear. Let me ask you, what is, what is, what is in your home right now? 
right? What is, what is pervading in your home right now, right? Some of you might be having clouds of doubt and fear in your home, darkness, negativity, discourse, strife, rebellion, stinking thinking, attitude, sickness, depression, and disease. How many of you know those kinds of things will flee when you bring Christ's presence in the center of your home and family? Amen? They leave when Jesus shows up. It's called a house cleaning. We need to do some of that. It's springtime, right? We want to clean our house so that where fear once reigned, there's now faith. Where depression once lingered, there's now joy in the house. Where there was bondage that ruled, now there is freedom. Once there is death, now there is life. It happens every time we invite the presence of Christ to come into our space, through our doorway, and fill our hearts and homes. Fantastic things will take place. And so the house was unified, the house was cleansed, and then lastly, the house was empowered. And you see it here. Jesus stands beside the bed where the little girl was laying dead. He holds her hand. He tells her to get up. Immediately she stands to her feet and walks around. It's an incredible miracle. But you know, the thing that really spoke to me about this story is not recorded in Mark's account. You find it in Matthew's account. It says this in Matthew 9, 26. In this story... It says the report of this miracle swept throughout the entire countryside. Wow. The whole region, the surrounding area was was impacted and influenced because what had taken place in the home of this hurting family. And I can't help but think that Jairus and his wife became a major source of encouragement and hope to all of those who themselves had found themselves in a dark and discouraging place, right? I can't help but think that because they were able to say, hey, folks, we've been there. We've been there. We were there. We were in a place darker than you, more hopeless than you. We were there, and and yet God came and answered our prayer, and because of it, we can say with all faith and confidence, he will do the same for you. He'll do the same. It's called empowering our families and homes to become the salt and light we so desperately need them to be. That's what God wants to do with our children and family and marriages. God is committed to bringing hope and healing to this lost and broken world. How do you think he's going to do it? He's going to do it through your family. One of the major ways God wants to heal people in this, especially nowadays in such a dysfunctionally, relationally dysfunctional society is through the lighthouse of your healed and restored family. God wants to use you, your children, your home, your marriage to bring grace and hope to those who don't have it. Someone has an alarm clock here. It's time to get up. (laughs) And so get ready because the spirit of empowerment is going to come upon you in your homes. You believe it? It's going to come upon you. God wants to use you. You are the salt of the the, the world. You're, you're, You're the light on the hill. God wants to use your family in powerful ways. And so in closing, the journey that we as parents take Lead us straight to the feet of Jesus as we pour out our fears and our disappointments and our burdens to him. The voices that we as parents listen to, I want are they voices of faith or voices of fear? Are they voices that bring hope or voices that create despair? And then lastly, the doorway we as parents open up, is it a doorway of our hearts, the doorway of our homes, the doorway of our marriage and family as we invite the very person of Christ to come in and take his rightful place among us. And that's the only way we can become the courageous, fearless parents God has called us to be. Amen. Amen.
You know, we're going to close in just a bit, but um, in the seat pocket in front of you, you'll find a piece of paper like this. I want you to grab it. It's a little card. It's a blank card. And I want you to take it. If there's not one there, use a Connect card or whatever. But what we're going to do is we're going to write the names of our children and grandchildren on that card. And then what we're going to do is we're, we're going to come forward and place them in the, these baskets. And I'm going to ask one of our elders to come in and they're going to pray over them. We live in a troubling world, right? You know, I, I saw it on Facebook the other day. It said in, in the 70s, we used to, people used to take acid because the world was too boring, something like that. I need to write it down. No. In the 70s, people used to take acid because the world was too normal. And now the world is too crazy, so now they take Prozac. I'll have to get the real quote. It doesn't quite work. But I say all that to say we live in troubling times. Sometimes when we send our kids out the door to school, it's like we're sending them out to the wolves. And as parents, sometimes we get so full of fear and anxiety and we say, God, it's just too big of a task for me. And I can't help but hear the voice of our loving Savior saying, yes, it's too big for you, so give it to me. Give your children to me. Place them in my hands, at my feet. I love them more than you love them. I have a destiny and a plan for every single one of them. And let me build the house. Because unless the Lord builds, our labor is in vain. And so I want us to write the names of our children, our grandchildren. Maybe you don't have any children. Write the names of your parents. Write the names of your siblings. And as the worship team leads us in this song, I want you to get out of your seat, put the prayer cards in these baskets, and we're going to pray over them. Amen.